We read chapter 2 in Romans that explained that um, Paul said the possession of the law or circumcision will not save a Jewish person. And it, it's kind of hard for us to understand, so I wanted to just kind of give a, a brief explanation of what he was talking about. The Jewish people are God's people. But Paul is trying to explain to them that they're being saved on an individual basis, just like everybody else. And it goes all the way back to the book of Exodus in chapter 19. Now, if you remember, Exodus chapter 20 is the giving of the Ten Commandments. So this was before the law was given. <clears throat> in chapter 19, the children of Israel had just left Egypt. They were about three months out. They arrived at Mount Sinai. And God said, I'm going to make a covenant with these people. He directed Moses and said, we're going to make a covenant. And I will be their God and they will be my people. This first covenant included all of the nation of Israel. It had nothing to do with the individual, but it had everything to do. Were you an Israelite? And if you were, you were a member of that covenant. And then God said to Moses, come up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and I want to give you some commandments. Now, sometimes we think that it was only the Ten Commandments that he received, but um, I believe he also gave him parts of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, some of the, it, it was the law that he gave him. So there might have been more. The Ten Commandments are what he gave him written on the stone. Um, Moses was gone for 40 days. And while he was gone, the children of Israel began to murmur and complain and, and said, where is this Moses fellow? We don't really know what happened to him. He's been gone a long time. Aaron, make us a God. We can't continue on in this wilderness without a God. Make us a God. And Aaron complied with the people and said, bring me your gold. And he threw it into the fire and he said, out came this calf. <laughs> I don't think it was quite that simple. But when Moses came down from the mountain, he was very angry. So angry, as a matter of fact, that he threw the Ten Commandments down and broke them, the stones. And God had to make another set for, for the children of Israel. And at that time, Moses begged God to take them back and, and to be their God. And in fact, Moses offered to give his own life. If, it, if it's, you can blot me out of, the, out of the book of life, but please come back and be our God. And so God relented and he said, okay. We'll make another covenant, but this covenant is going to be different. This covenant is only going to include those who obey and keep the law and keep my covenant. This covenant does not include everyone in Israel. And so it's just like um, everyone else. Each person is going to be judged on an individual basis. So the question is, if this is the case, then what is the advantage of being a Jew? Okay. Um, after all, if there's no favoritism with God, as we, as we found last, last week, in God there is no favoritism, what is the advantage of being a Jew? And that's how Paul begins in Romans chapter 3. What advantage there is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision, much in every way? First of all, the Jews that were entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Paul said there are a lot of advantages to being a Jew. The Jews were the ones who received the, the law. They were the librarians, if you will, or the protectors of God's word for about 4,000 years. And they did an amazing job of keeping the Old Testament for us and preserving it as a matter of fact, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948, those texts for the Dead Sea Scrolls dated to about 200 years before the time of Jesus. That was during the intertestamental period, those 400 years when those were written. And they were word for word, almost word for word with our current Old Testament text with the Bible. And then um, the Jews will also have a place at end times. The Jews were God's people in the, in the beginning, but they're going to be God's people again in the end. 
God made a promise to Abraham that is still in effect to this very day. God made several promises to Abraham. We're going to look at some of those promises in Romans chapter 4. Those are exciting promises. But the one promise I wanted to mention to you today was the promise of land. God told Abraham that the Jewish nation would have a section of land and the boundaries that he described in Genesis have never been received yet. The most land that Israel ever had was at the time of King Solomon. And he did not have the land all the way down to the Nile River, all the way up to the Euphrates, to the Persian Gulf, to the Mediterranean Sea. So if they have never had this much land yet, what does that mean? I'll tell you what my Old Testament professor said. That means it's still to come. The Jews are going to figure in history in the end times. And one day, that promise to Abraham will be kept. God's word is eternal. God still has a place for the Jews and Israel as a nation in the future. But notice verse 3 said, what if some were unfaithful? Would their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? And really, that's what this whole message is about this morning, is the faithfulness of God doesn't depend on our faithfulness. Not at all. The fact that the Jews as a group had rejected the Messiah does not make the Messiah less wonderful or less true. God's faithfulness to them was not in vain. It doesn't mean that God's work was futile and without effect. God is faithful, which means that God's work was perfect. The faithfulness, salvation, and the gospel message will always be true regardless of how people respond to it. The message of Christ and the forgiveness of sins has nothing to do with our response. It has everything to do with what God did. Our acceptance or rejection of salvation doesn't change the salvation process. I'm not going to go into salvation today because that's the message that Jeremiah is going to bring to us next Sunday. Is God's plan for sin. Um, I will say that we should be encouraged that salvation and the gospel message will endure forever regardless of how it is accepted by the masses of people. Which brings me up to my second point this morning. The faithfulness of God does not depend on man's faithfulness. When the wickedness of man had become so great in the days of Noah that God destroyed the earth with water, he made a promise. And that promise was a rainbow. And he said, never again will I destroy the earth with water no matter how wicked man has, will become. And we know that today mankind is, I, I don't know if we're just as wicked as we were in the days of Noah, but I suspect we're getting pretty close. We certainly are a wicked world. But God did not, God has kept his word. He said, I'm not going to destroy it with water again. Now we know he's going to destroy the world again in the future, but it's going to be with fire. It's not going to be with water. Let God be true and every man a liar. God is faithful. God is the Lord of the harvest, and we are only workers in the field. We have stories of missionaries that have spent almost their entire careers in a foreign mission field with hardly any converts. The first missionary to go from America was Adoniram Judson, and he went to India, specifically Burma, when he was 25 years old. He took his newly married wife, and they went over to India. He was there for 40 years. And in those 40 years, there was only 18 converts that we know of. Um, I'm sure there were times when he felt discouraged. I'm sure there were times when he wondered what God was doing or if he was in the will of God and doing what was right. Of course, the greatest missionary the world has ever seen was the Apostle Paul. And everywhere he went, he was beaten, he was thrown in jail, he was ran out of town. The message was not accepted. Sharing the word of God is not an easy task. Success for a Christian is defined as spreading the word. There are several illustrations in the Bible where Jesus talks about a sower and the seed. Success is def defined as spreading the word. What a relief it was for me early in my ministry to realize that I am not responsible for the results. George Sweeting is a former uh, president of Moody Bible College. And he wrote a little book called The No Guilt Guide to Witnessing. And 
I, I was so encouraged to read in there that success is spreading the word. And that alone is our primary responsibility. We can't make the seed grow. We're not responsible for the harvest. Sometimes we're allowed to participate in the harvest. Sometimes we're allowed to help water. But success as a Christian is to sow the seed. Of course, along with spreading the seed, we don't want to be offensive to others along the way doing that. We want to be kind and loving. Um, when we get discouraged, we can imagine how God felt when his people, the Jews, rejected their Messiah. We can imagine how discouraged he felt. Um, Paul is saying that the Jews' rejection of Jesus is not a failure on the part of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. As Christians, we believe the word of God over the universal opinions of man, no matter how widespread those opinions become. The population of the world currently 7.7 .7 billion people, give or take a few. 7.7 .7 billion. The vast majority of those do not believe in biblical creation as described in the book of Genesis. The vast majority of those 7.7 .7 billion people do not believe in the traditional family values, one man and one woman for life. They don't believe that. The vast majority of them do not believe in the sanctity of life. So who's right? The opinions of the world, the vast majority, or God? Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. Verses 8, 5 to 8. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still considered a sinner? Why not, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil so that good may result. Their condemnation is just. Paul said this is a ridiculous argument. And let me explain it to you. If my unrighteousness demonstrates God's righteousness, how can God judge me? My sin ultimately serves to bring him glory, and that's a good thing. It makes no sense. The arguments of man don't make sense to those who trust and believe in God's word. Paul picks up on this theme again in Romans chapter 6 when he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. Inconceivable. You remember that one? It's a ridiculous argument. The word of God says that God is in control of everything. So it's his fault when things go wrong. Don't we use this argument today? God, why didn't you fix it? God, you're our healer. Why did you let this person in our life die? God, why did you allow me to have this car accident and total my vehicle? You could have stopped it, God. It's your fault. Why did you allow this to happen? We even get ridiculous in our arguments with blaming God. We say, God, uh, why did you allow the bank to repossess my truck? You could, have, um, you could have provided the money for me. You could have even made the payment. The most ridiculous argument along this line would be the argument of Judas. Think about Judas, the disciple of Jesus. Lord, I know I betrayed you, but you used it for your good. In fact, Jesus, if I had not done it, you wouldn't have gone to the cross. What I did fulfilled scripture, Lord. How can you judge me? The answer is that God used the wickedness and the betrayal of Judas. But it was still the wickedness and the betrayal of Judas. Using chess terminology, we are not simply pawns in the hands of an almighty God. God does control everything. But he also gives us free choice. He gives us choice because he's God. He even uses our sins and our failure to glorify himself and to further his kingdom. I look back on my past and I am amazed that God has used my failures, my mistakes, and my bad decisions to bring me to the place that I am today, this morning. It's true that God will use the unrighteousness of man to accomplish his work and to bring praise to his name but it's still our unrighteousness. 
and we still need to confess it. It's also true that part of the way that God glorifies himself in man's sin is by judging, righteously judging, in his, his un, the, that unrighteousness, our unrighteousness. If there were no consequences for sin, we would live in anarchy. Have you ever heard of that word, anarchy? Do you know what it means? It's kind of a popular word with some of our young people. Uh, maybe 15 years ago it was more popular, but it's defined as the absence of government and the absolute freedom of individuals to do whatever they choose. Anarchy is a society being freely constituted without authority or governing body. The word literally means the absence of all government. Wouldn't that be a great world? How long would it last? <laughs> I don't think it would last very long. We need the discipline of God in our lives for our own protection. It's for our own protection. If there were no judgment day, how would that change the way you live? More and more theologians are progressing to the point where they now believe that God is such a loving God that in the end, he's going to save everybody. That's real popular nowadays among popular theologians. No one is going to go to hell. God is a loving God. But if you believe that, how would it change your thinking? How would it change your lifestyles and the decisions you make? Would we not become self-centered and go back to the ancient Greek philosophy that the highest goal and proper view of life is pleasure, hedonism. And then later, the progressive Greek theologian says, no, 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 it's not just simply pleasure. Your pleasure doesn't count. It's my pleasure that's important. Ego hedonism, that's what's important. If it were not for the hand of God in our lives, would we not go back to living that type of a lifestyle? Paul tells us exactly where we would be without God's presence in verses 9 to 12. What shall we, they, we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is none, no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul considers himself one of the Jews. And when he uses the word we, he's using it to demonstrate that the pagan, the moralist, and the Jew all fall under sin and condemnation. The words under sin refer to the bondage of sin. In scripture, it's called slavery. We are in slavery to sin because it's not in our control. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Where is it written? Well, Paul's now going to share about the condition of man. And this is where it's written. The next few verses I'm going to read to you, they're found in Psalms 14, 1 to 3, Psalms 5, 9, Psalms 143, Psalms 10, 7, Psalms 36, 1, and Isaiah 59, 7 to 8. All of these passages of scripture refer to what's next Paul writes. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. Paul looks at the human condition from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. He starts with our head and he moves down. Warren Wearsby calls this passage of scripture an x-ray of the lost sinner from the top of their head to their feet. It's a picture of the human condition and it's depressing. What's your point here, Paul? On Monday morning when I was getting ready studying Romans chapter 3, Marilyn said, boy, I hope your sermon's more encouraging this week. The last two weeks has been pretty tough. And, and this is what we're running into? Well, Paul does have a point. And his point for the first part of, of Romans chapter 3 is this. It is imperative for us to understand our complete inability to save ourselves. We cannot assist at all in the salvation process. 
If it were possible for man to fix the brokenness, Jesus would have never had to die. Paul is setting us up for the sermon next Sunday, which says God's answer to sin. But first, we must understand our fallen condition. There has never been a truly righteous man except Jesus. Adam was not righteous. He was simply innocent. He did not know the difference between right and wrong. He wasn't righteous. Once again, this verse describes our world today. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Is that not true today? There is no fear of God. It is the fear of God and the final judgment of the world that restrains wickedness. When we lose the fear of God, we lost our morality, our standards, our decency, and our reason. Every sin and rebellion against God happens because we do not have a proper fear or respect for him. Where there's sin, there is no fear of God. By the same token, the fear of God is what keeps us from sin. God is faithful. Even though we remain unfaithful. God is faithful. And I'm going to leave you there because next Sunday, Jeremiah is going to point us to salvation. Point us to Christ. But I hope you understand our fallen condition. We can't help ourselves. We're broken. We're broken beyond repair. It's going to take a miracle from Almighty God to fix our lives. Father God, I thank you so much for your presence here this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for the lessons of history, even though we don't learn very well. Father, I thank you for your coming judgment. I thank you, Father, for the discipline in our life that is meant for our protection and for our help. Father, we don't enjoy that. We don't enjoy the discipline at all. But it's a good thing because it draws us closer to you. Thank you so much, Father, that you have provided a way out for mankind. That we put ourselves in a terrible mess, in a hole that we could never climb out of. But you came down and fixed it. And you lifted us up. Thank you, Father. In your precious name.